I'm Eric. Uh, I work at two different companies, not here in Rotterdam, I'm actually in Amsterdam. I work for a survey field, which is a, a pre bit analytics company, advertising analytics, handling lots of requests, using Go for that. And I work at Pokey, which is an HTML5 gaming company. Also uses Go, but more for like uh, the backend services, the different. Uh, and I will be talking about fuzz testing. And my first question to you all is like, who already knows about fuzz testing? Who has used it before, maybe even? Okay, only a couple of people, that's good. <laughs> then it's at least new for a lot of people. Okay, uh, what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about uh, why fuzzing, why fuzz testing? So fuzz testing is also called fuzzing. Uh, what is fuzzing? How does it work? Three common types, trophies, the future for it, and then the questions. Let's start. Why fuzzing? Well, writing tests is boring. You probably also know that from all the tests you wrote. You probably all know it, like no one really liked testing when you asked it just now. Uh, writing tests is boring, like this is a simple test case, like I'm assuming most people here know Go at least a little bit. Like, does everyone know? Has everyone written a test like this before? Let's say like that. Or is, is this really new for some people here? Because then I can explain a bit more. But yeah, boring test. Like you've all seen this before. You have the input, output, expected. You have your cases. You have your code that tests it. Here I'm testing the strings to upper function uh, as an example. Boring. Um, <coughs> And humans write biased tests. Like when you're writing tests, you have to think of the test cases. So you're only gonna think of the things where you wrote the code. So you're gonna think of like, oh yeah, if I have this input and that output, and you're gonna think about the stuff that, that's probably gonna work because you wrote the code as well. So sometimes you want to randomize your tests a bit or do it a bit differently. So uh, Go since 1.14 has had the testing slash quick package. Who knows about this package? Two persons, yeah. This is a really unknown package. No one uses it and that's probably better because it's not that great. But what this package does, <laughs> yeah. It's like from before first testing was a thing. But this, uh, this like, I wrote a different test here uh, to test if uh, strings dot two valid UTF-8 actually produces valid UTF-8 strings. What the testing.quickpackage does, it exposes a function check that you pass your own function to with any input. Like in, in this case, uh, I don't know, do I have a pointer? How can I point with this? Ah, yeah. Uh, I have a, an S string as input for this function. I pass this function to quick.check. What it's gonna do is it's gonna generate random strings. It's gonna write random strings and see if this function, until this function returns false. So it's just strings. And uh, if this function is somehow invalid, then maybe we'll find it this way. It will generate like a couple of thousands of random input and that's it. Uh, you can here, the S string, you can also do other types, like basically all basic types. You can have integers there, you can have whatever. You can even have your own structs there and uh, like uh, a second argument, it has a config and the config you can do like a value function which generates the structs. So it's basically to test random inputs to your functions, uh, which is nice, but I've tried using this and it's not that useful because those couple thousand random strings it generates here, that's like, that's not really that useful. Like, if you really want to test random input to some function, you need a bit of it more advanced, and that's where fuzz testing comes in. So fuzz testing actually picks those random inputs in a smarter way. Um, it's uh, native since 1.18 in Go. Uh, before that, it was already a thing for a long time. I, I saw that like, developers with uh, like the punch card, you know, in like the 19, so many, of, even they did fuzz testing by finding the garbage bin with all the punch cards from other people, just taking those out and running them through their own programs to see if they crashed anything. So it's really old fuzz testing, but 
In Go, it's uh, since 1.18. Before that, we had uh, this package. I don't know if anyone used that before, but that's uh, written by someone. Uh, it was a bit more complicated because what uh, this uh, Govus uh, did was uh, it kind of took over part of the compiler. So to, to add instrumentation and stuff, I'll get into that later, to your code, it would have to parse your code and do stuff with it. And it was really complicated. And with each Go build, uh, each new Go version, it would break again. So it was not so nice. So since 118, it's in uh, natively in Go. And uh, 119, the current version, also contained a lot of improvements again. Uh, under the hood, it uses libfuzzer, which is uh, written in C. So I'm not going to go into that uh, this meetup because it's C code, we don't look at that. But uh, it's, it's shipped with, uh, with Go as like a statically linked uh, uh, library. And libfuzzer is uh, maintained by Google and it's being used for a lot of other things as well. And it's still uh, in active development, also the, the Go site. So uh, let's look at a fuzz test. So you all know how the Go tests are. They always start with uh, test uh, something. They're in the underscore test files. The fuzz uh, tests are also in the underscore test files, but they start with uh, fuzz instead of test, and they want a testing.f as a parameter instead of a testing.t. And what you do with a fuzz test is, uh, uh, let's look at this first. You, you call f.fuzz again with a function with some a testing uh, as a parameter. And in this case, a string again, because I'm using the same code. But this string can also be any uh, different types. And again, I'm testing like uh, two valid UTF-8. And if it's uh, not valid, then I'm going to fail the test. So it's a bit same as a normal test, uh, only this time like your inputs are random and you, yeah, you use fuzz. Um, Again, like that second argument, so uh, the second argument here to the fuzz uh, function is uh, dynamic. So well, what f.fuzz actually accepts is any as argument. It's not like it doesn't want a function with some specific type as argument, just any. So you can, if your function input to what you want to test is a string, you do a string here. If it's something else, you do something else. So for example, you have one with a byte slice and an integer as argument. Uh, all the allowed types are basically all the Go primitive types, uh, string, byte slices, booleans, well, everything. In the future, maybe more types, but that's it for now. Um, and when you run it, you can only run one fuzz test at a time, so you really have to specify min fuzz and then the name of your test. So you cannot fuzz all the different fuzz functions you have at the same time. You really have to pick one, and it's just going to run until you basically kill it. Like it, it doesn't have an end. It's just gonna run like a lot of uh, times per second your function. It's gonna look for interesting inputs. I'll get to that later. And it's just gonna run. So the idea is that you run this for an hour or how long you want. Uh, Google Chromium team has like a, a service for open source repositories where they first test it for you. So uh, fast HTTP, which is a library I maintain. Google Chromium team has a fuzzer running day and night for that. So each time I release a new version, they will just fuzz that new version forever. Super useful. They found a lot of uh, interesting bugs. Um, so let's look at a more realistic, uh, well, realistic quote <laughs> example. Uh, I wrote a simple function which checks, like uh, I get a byte slices input and it uh, wants to the input to be gophers uh, exclamation, uh, exclamation mark exclamation mark and there's a bug in this function does anyone see it immediately yeah exactly it uh, checks if the length is nine but it actually checks the nine item so it actually sh this should be ten so hey there's a bug in my function um so i wrote a fuzzer for this so i just say give me a byte slice and uh, well actually now that i think about it i don't have to fail here because i made but Anyways, uh, if it finds it, I'm, uh, I'm going to fail, because uh, whatever. Um, if I do, would test this with a go quick package, it's never going to get generated. Like out of a couple thousand inputs, the chances that it generates this is like super low. So that's really not going to be useful. But if I run this with go fuzz, uh, it took like uh, three seconds, and it immediately finds the panic. So it's it definitely found this. And sorry, I had to break this screenshot up in multiple uh, 
Um, so it, it prints out the panic, like, hey, I found a panic. And uh, at the bottom, so this is the same uh, continued, it says like, oh, I stored the output here. So for your fuzzers, it's actually gonna store the, the corpus, it's called, like the, the input that it found, hey, it crashes on this, it's gonna store it. And the next time you roll, gun, roll, <coughs> run go test without a fuzzer or anything, it's still gonna test this input with the fuzzer, but it's not gonna fuzz normal things. Um, how does it work? Like, how does it find it so quickly an input that crashes this? Because remember, it, it has to find an input which is nine long and has to start with all this before it reaches this point and crashes. So not just any input of length 10 is gonna crash this. No, it really needs to match all the way until this. So it really needs to find an input that is interesting that, that crashes. How does that work? Uh, well, it doesn't just generate random inputs. It's, it's actually uh, coverage guided fuzzing. Now, who here uses uh, coverage uh, or uh, checks the coverage of their tests? Okay, most of them. So for the people who don't do that, like coverage in you, if you do go test, you can say minus cover is uh, something. It will give you an output and it will tell you like 90% uh, of your functions or code is tested, 10% isn't. Um, fuzzing uses that same coverage uh, instrumentation to look at it. So it tries to maximize the amount of executed code during fuzzing. So it really, if you have a function with a lot of if else statement, things like that, it really tries to go into each of these statements. But how does it do that? Well, a really simple example, if I have like a function with an if statement in it and two uh, branches, it's gonna keep some counters. It's gonna keep a counter like, hey, how often do I reach up in this case uh, part of the if statement and how often do I reach this part of the if statement? Um, and then, oh, oh wait. Uh, when you actually run, when the fuzzer runs, it's gonna see, every, each time it executes your function on an input, it's gonna see like, oh, how many of these counters reached uh, higher than zero? And then with the next input, it's gonna check like, hey, did some of these counters change? And if none of those counters change, it knows like, hey, okay, I have to try a new input again. Uh, if those counters change, then hey, this is an interesting input, I've reached some more code. Okay, let's build further on that, and then it's gonna mutate the input based on that and see how far it can get. So it constantly tries to mutate the input to reach, to maximize how many counters are higher than zero. So if we go back to uh, this example, at some point it will find like, hey, if I have uh, an input of length nine, then I go further into the code, okay. So then the next time it generates an input of length 20 and it sees like, oh, no, I don't reach that anymore. Okay, so we need to keep it at nine. Okay, then it maybe finds like, hey, I need to first, needs to be a G. Further and further, it's like mutating based on where it reaches in your code. So that's super smart. Uh, but there are some other issues. If we have this function where we test the string, now it's just one if statement. And the string it needs to generate needs to be exactly this to get into the if statement. So that's a bit more complicated. Of course, you could write this as matching each letter again, like I wrote the other case, but then if they would unpack string compares like that, that would be really slow. So what 1.19 introduced is uh, different instrumentation functions, which uh, lib further uh, understands. So now when there's a string comparison in your Go code, it will insert uh, this function as well, which is a function of libfuzzer. And then libfuzzer knows like, oh, hey, a string comparison is happening here. So I should probably do something with that. And then it can easily say like, okay, I need to match something like this. So if you would run this fuzzer in 1.18, it would just run for a very long time before it randomly reaches this input. But if you run this in 1.19, it takes like a second or something to find this. It's immediately like, oh, hey, I find this. So that's already a really big improvement. Um, let's talk about a couple of types of fuzzing because you saw like you have random inputs and then you see what your function does. That's of course a little bit limited. Like you cannot, uh, have it do so, normally you test with like you know the input and then the output it should generate. 
But if your input is random, then you usually don't know what the output should be. So you, you can't really test if your function works correctly, but you can test if it doesn't panic, for example. So uh, let's go to this. So here, for example, uh, I get a byte slice as input and I test the unmarshal function. But I cannot test what A is, because, well, unless I have another JSON implementation, then I can test. But I can only test, like, does JSON not unmarshal? Is there any input here where it crashes? So that's what fuzzing is good for one of those things. So the Go team also does this. Another thing is round trip fuzzing. Like, if you have an, an encoder and a decoder, then you can just take the input, unmarshal it into something, uh, marshal that back into an output again, and then unmarshal it again and check if that matches. I did it like this in three steps, unmarshal, marshal, unmarshal, because if you compare this output, which is byte slice, to this input, that's always going to be different. Like, does someone know a case where that's different? Probably not for a popular app. I found that uh, immediately. If the input is 0.0, .0 then you're going to marshal it into here, which returns a floating point zero. If you're going to marshal that again, it's going to just write zero instead of 0, 0.0. So that's always immediately it finds ish cases where that happens. Or I had a case where it's uh, the input was 1.0000000. Yeah, if you unmarshal and marshal that again, it's just going to be one again. So, so that's why I mar unmarshal it again into an any object, and then I reflect the deep equal those two. This, I, I ran it for a while, it doesn't find anything wrong. So the JSON marshal and unmarshal functions really are like the opposite. If, if the input is correct, the opposite of each other, there's no bug in there. It's always good to know. So if you have any data parsing, unparsing, uh, uh, functions, definitely fuzz test them. Another interesting uh, case is uh, called differential uh, fuzzing. So I have here uh, two different versions of uh, YAML uh, parsing packages. And I'm just gonna get like another byte slice again as input. And I'm just gonna try to unmarshal that byte slice with both libraries and see if they are equal or not. So we can actually test if, if we have two implementations, then we can test if either of them are correct. And there's going to be a lot of cases where one of them is, uh, does the correct thing and the other doesn't, and then we find it here or the other way around. So very useful uh, to do this as well. And also very useful if you ever want to switch YAML library and you want to be more for sure that they actually work the same way. Uh, so when I run this, I thought interesting to run. It uh, only took like a couple of uh, seconds before it found the case. This weird YAML, uh, so uh, it saves the, like I said, it saves the, the, out, the input that crashed uh, or that, that resulted in uh, failure. It saves it. So this is what that, uh, that file looks like. It apparently found uh, byte slice uh, zero, zero uh, colon, and uh, they both unmarshal this differently. One of them uses a zero byte, uh, a map with a zero uh, byte as a key and an empty interface, and the other one does zero, zero. I don't know, but so probably one of them is wrong, or maybe the YAML specification is, uh, I don't know, maybe unclear about that. Um, trophies, oh yeah. So uh, I took this from, uh, not from the, the, the Go uh, fuzzer package, but this is from uh, that GoFuzz uh, library that existed before it was in Go. They, oh, I have to press play. They, uh, have a list of bugs that they found using the fuzzer. And well, it's a, a very long list. You can see it's all the way like in the, in the assembly generator from Go, regular expressions, time parsing, HTTP, uh, tar archives where it's panicked, uh, a lot of the stuff, images, uh, super interesting. So there were certain images where Go would just crash on uh, if you put them in. Another interesting thing as well, there's also people who use fuzzers to generate valid images. Because you can just tell, build a fuzzer, like parse the bytes as an image, and if it succeeds, then stop. And then the fuzzer is just going to go until it generates a valid image. That's super interesting. Yeah. 
And it's quite smart at it, because it really looks at those if else statements and checks like what kind of code it needs to generate. So you saw there's a lot of bugs found with uh, fuzzing. Um, next. Uh, for the future, uh, there's still very active development. Uh, they're looking mostly in uh, different strategies for fuzzing. So right now, like I said, the coverage-based fuzzing, it just tries to maximize how many branches it reaches. But there's other uh, better strategies that people already thought of to find interesting cases even easier. Uh, there's work on that. I don't know uh, when we'll get that in Go, but at some point, definitely. And uh, for the future, it's also important to get more people interested because uh, it's super useful to run fuzzing. Um, at my companies, we also do some fuzzing. We uh, have, for example, a function that anonymizes email addresses somewhere. So it, it, you just give it an email address and it gives like a email address without a name or stars or whatever. I don't even know exactly anymore. We just first test that just to be sure, like, is there nothing, no in email input that could crash it? Uh, some other parser stuff we definitely first test. Uh, in the survey that I hope you all filled in for Go, uh, was recently there was a survey, the results came out. They also asked people about uh, fuzzing. Um, Half of the people said uh, they're open to fuzzing, but they don't have any need yet. But I feel like that's probably because people don't understand how exactly to use it. Some people are interested, some people already use it, some people don't know. And uh, uh, yeah, what if any has made it challenging for you to use Go's built-in fuzzing tools? And uh, the best answer was like, needs better docs. Uh, there are some examples now uh, of how to use it, but they're quite big. Uh, maybe my slides will give you a little bit more insight how to easily start with fuzzing. Others say it's low priority because they don't know what kind of bugs their code has, I guess. Um, yeah, that was it. Like, uh, are there any questions?